butts, asses, glutes. Everybody wants a nice butt. At least everybody likes to look at a nice butt. This is true for men and for women and for those of you that don't identify with either. The butt is a very important muscle. It's sexy. It provides stability and power. The problem is it's hard to develop sometimes for some people. So in today's episode, we talk all about the best exercises for developing amazing butt muscles. Now, here's the giveaway, and a lot of you are going to be shocked because this is a huge giveaway. Uh, we're going to give away the Butt Builder Bundle for free to one of you lucky viewers. Now, this includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Aesthetic, Kettlebell for Aesthetics, and specific programming with the trigger sessions and focus sessions for building the butt. We're going to give that away for free to one of you, but you got to do the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, if we think your comment's the best comment, we'll notify you and you'll get that butt builder bundle for free. Now, everybody else, check this out. We don't want to leave you out either, so this is what we're going to do. The Butt Builder Bundle normally takes those programs and discounts them like 25% off or something like that. Well, here's what we've done for this episode is we've taken that and discounted it an additional 50% off. So it's half off an already discounted bundle. This is huge, but it does end October 31st. So if you're interested in signing up, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com, check out the Build Your Butt Bundle, and then use the code BUTT50, B-U-T-T-5-0 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, guys, it's time to talk about the butt. Yeah, the, the butt. Justin's favorite. Sorry, subject. I got excited. Justin's, everybody's favorite. You know what? You know what's interesting about this? If you think about it, because when you talk about like muscles that that people tend to rank, you know, near the top in terms of attractiveness, they actually find this with men and with women. So women will even say, "I've heard you say that," but is that true? It is. When you look at dude, uh, baseball pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He notices so it. many girls. I swear he has Let's like all the baseball moves. Pants. Like <laughs> yeah. his carpenter thing with his shirt off with his wife. I don't know, maybe in, it's just me, but I've heard back it from many softball times. practice wearing his pants <laughs> all you know. Sit. Hey, honey, <laughs> it's a thing. You, you were guys. so quick to answer yeah. that right there. No, but it, it's true. When they do polls, women will rank the butt up there. Men rank the butt. No, up I believe there. that. I always thought that for women it was arms. That's why I thought arms is up there too. But yeah. so is the butt. And okay. People don't think that, right? They don't think women are into. I would say it's the yeah. top. Top three mm -hmm. uh, things I was hired for. I would say that's one. When you fat loss, obviously number one, right? Mm -hmm. Most people come in and say yep. they want to lose, but I would say butt is a, either a close two or three as well, far whole as industries now uh, devoted. No, to... No, of course. Yeah, I mean, and look, a lot of this, everywhere. and you know, we might say people might think, oh, this is driven by marketing and advertising, but reality, it's uh, evolution and biology drives marketing and advertising. So you got to ask yourself, why is the butt a muscle that everybody focuses on? And also, by the way, if you look at like ancient sculptures, primitive uh, statues and sculptures, they tend to place an emphasis on the butt, the glutes. Look at Greek, Greek sculptures, develop muscular backs, hips, and glutes. And so you think, well, what the hell is going on? When you look at primates, there's a few differences between humans and primates, structurally speaking. One of the greatest ones is the size of our glutes. We have yeah. massive butt muscles compared to other primates, and it's because we walk on two legs, we balance, and we run, and we run better than any primate that there is. It's also very involved in throwing and generating power. You have to have powerful glutes to do that. Do you think we've lost our ass in the last hundred years? <laughs> Probably. No, I'm serious. Like, because we don't, we don't sit like in the squatted position as much. Like we're, we're more sedentary. We're not throwing like you, you're alluding to right now. Like we're not doing a lot of yeah. these things. So do you think that we've lost our ass? Over I think we turned into shrimps. Where we're basically curled forward, we have no butt, and uh, our shoulders are super protracted. Well, it's a, it's a big reason why we have a lot of back pain. Like People don't realize that that stability, a lot of it comes also from the glutes. It's the lumbo, pelvic, hip area, right? right so it's right. not just the core. It's not just your abs and your obliques and your low back. It's also, actually, believe it or not, some, some of the lower lats. And then the glutes, which really weak glutes cause a lot of problems in people. And so- uh, you know, evolutionarily speaking, when we see healthy, strong-looking glutes, we can't help but find them attractive because that probably meant that he could run fast and he could throw with a lot of power or she was very stable and strong and had good... You know, even uh, women with developed glutes or when they store body fat in that area have better fatty acid profiles, you know, for offspring. And 
So it's just one of those things that's like a big deal. So this is why there's so much that surrounds, you know, butt training and butt development and what it means. And even today, if you look at athletes, like especially explosive athletes, that you could tell a lot by looking at an athlete's hip area. You really can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 100%. Like yeah. how powerful or how fast or how high they can jump by the way their hips look for sure. Oh, yeah. Glutes. Yeah, Absolutely. look at sprinters. They've got these yeah. huge glutes because they can generate, you know, tremendous speed. So it's a muscle that um, that is very important and, of course, very attractive. Um, and developing it, if you do things right – you should be able to develop it pretty well. The problem is that there's a lot of challenges that people have along the way to developing, you know, big glutes. And some of it has to do with just, you know, poor advertising and poor exercise programming, but there's more. Yeah, no, I think a lot of it has to do with going back to my point of how sedentary we are, um, you know, understanding anatomy. And like when you sit in a chair, like we are all right now, you shorten the hip flexors. And when you go to stand up, if you have really shortened hip flexors, it kind of puts you in this kind of forward position. Now, I'd be exact, this is exaggerating it, right? But when we stand up, you have this shortened hip flexor and you're, you're leaned over yeah. like this. And so you're putting all this weight on the front of your quads. Yeah. And then you go and you go to train exercises for your glutes and you can't help but the quads take over. That has to be the number one issue that I had to deal with with helping somebody out. It was just simply they were doing all the butt exercises that they read in the magazines or they heard from people that they're supposed to be doing. But the problem was their glutes just weren't firing properly. And it has a lot to do, I think, with posture more than yeah. anything else. And then mm -hmm. we all wear elevated heel shoes, even men. We don't wear heels like women do, but I mean, running shoes, tennis shoes, all of them, the heel is slightly elevated. That brings your, your, your center of gravity forward a little bit. And that places more emphasis on the quads in fact, if you're doing squats and you want to hit your quads, one of the things you do is you elevate your heels. I know, and you've mm -hmm. brought this up before, evolutionary speaking, that that's ideal, like that's where the whole heel thing comes from, right? Sticks your butt out and it creates this illusion, but yeah. it actually creates uh, muscle recruitment patterns that right. deactivate That's the what's ironic about it is that you, you talk about that this whole idea that you know we're, we're naturally attracted to more pronounced glutes. But the high heels actually give you that, like a, almost like false advertisement. Yeah. It's not it's really artificial. They're, yeah, they're not really as as pronounced, and it ends up kind of shooting you in the foot if you're somebody who walks around in high heels yeah. all day long. It, it, there's the glutes are so important in balance. Um, you know, when I was training towards the end of my career, I trained a lot of people in advanced age, and you see very very underdeveloped glutes in uh, aging populations and weak. Mm -hmm. And they, and like Justin said, they get that, they start to develop that shrimp posture. And it, like, if I would strengthen their glutes a little bit, their balance would improve tremendously. Well, isn't that like one of the top injuries is you fall and break your hip mm -hmm. in advanced age? Yep. I mean, and that's, I think that's just a lack of good hip stability and hip stability comes from those, and the, those muscles that support and, and keep that stable. And if you don't train it, you lose it. You do. So I, I'd say, okay, so one of the number one reasons that I ran into, and I'd love your guys' feedback uh, for clients who just had issues developing their butt, besides not working out. So these are people who now are, have done some exercise and they're just like, yeah, it doesn't seem to respond. My butt doesn't seem to respond. I'd say probably the top reason is just they're not really connecting and firing their glutes really well when they're doing certain exercises. That would probably be the number one thing I can think of. And what people oftentimes don't realize is that just because you're doing a movement doesn't mean – you're really using the, the the your target muscles or the muscles mm. you're trying to work uh, to their their max capacity or at least efficiently or effectively. All, all your body's doing is it's moving in the motion that you're asking it to do. So if your butt is weak, it'll just ask other muscles to do the job. So you could be doing the movement right. and not really firing the glutes well, really well. I think too, like, and I blame some bit of uh, the high rep um, advertisement that's out there with women especially too, but um, just getting through the movements and workouts, a lot of times, you know, people think that they just need to get through the workout to be able to get the growth and the development of the muscle uh, instead of really focusing in on the intent of the exercise. So, uh, you know, one thing is to, to really kind of reduce the amount of reps, you know, and add load, uh, but also like before all that is to get that kind of connection, like you're saying. And so to, you know, adjust the hips and to make sure that, you um, 
uh, you're, you're really firing and activating glutes by, you know, making sure your hips are in the proper position to be even, even be able to, to, to fire properly uh, is step number one. And then to address those things in your programming is, you know, vital. Yeah, yeah, I think you're talking about the second most common, right? When you talk about heavy lifting, right? The first one is poor connection, 100%. Yeah. I, there, it's rare that I would get somebody who I didn't have to address posture issues first before being able to develop their glutes. Yep. It, it just, it's just rare. I, mean, I would say one out of 10 has got great posture, already fires the glutes. We can get straight to just good programming and I can develop their glutes. Most people, we have to address the connection first. Then the most common in just in my female clients is what- Especially female. Yeah, is what Justin's talking about, which is- you know, and especially early on in the career, I mean, it's, I think that's changing. I think CrossFit, uh, we've talked about this before. I think they're uh, a big part of that movement of getting women to lift heavy. Mm -hmm. But before CrossFit, when we were all still young trainers, man, it was you get. Uh, I'd get a female client that wanted to develop their glutes, and they'd never seen anything less than fifteen or fifteen reps yeah. before. Everything was 15, 20, 30, supersetting, low rest periods, jazzercise classes, body pump classes, circuit training. Like no one was doing deadlift squats, good mornings, hip thrust for five reps. That was just unheard of for like any female client. Yeah, well, I it, think it's just like it, that's that led into a lot of the problem of the poor connection that I saw like with clients coming in because they were doing a lot of the work, but they just weren't feeling their glutes being involved. So yeah, it is like it's important for you to understand like how to actually place and roll your hips into a good position to even get that kind of activation first but uh, the majority of the problem i've seen is because of you know just all these these reps with uh, based off momentum and not the intent yeah i told you know when it really dawned on me this was uh i don't know maybe six years into my career and i kept noticing with brand new clients when i would have them do an overhead press a lot of people have trouble with full extension so they'll come up and then they it's hard for them to really straighten their arm out and get this nice tall overhead press and so i tell people Strain your arms up, you know, taller, get the get the weight up there. And then they'd get stuck here and they'd come up on their toes. They'd go up on their toes. And I remember thinking, what the hell does your calves have to do with right. extending your arms? Like, I'm telling you to extend your arms. And then it dawned on me, their body understands get the weight higher mm -hmm. because that's what you're telling your arms. Essentially, what you're, what you're thinking is, I got to get the weight higher my trainer Sal told me to. So your body thinks, these muscles up here aren't doing it. Come up on your toes. That's what happens when you have a poor connection to your glutes. You go to do a squat or a hip thrust or a, a lunge and your glutes aren't really strong. Well, that's all right. We got the hamstrings and quads and they'll take over. And so if you don't teach your body to connect well, then you can't fire the glutes really well and it's hard to develop them. And then back to what you guys are talking about with heavy weight. Like, and when I say heavy weight, what I mean is training in a muscle building rep range. And that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively wide range, right? I would say six, five to six reps up to as high as 20 with high intensity and load. A lot of people, especially women, when they go to work out, they follow these online glute workout programs. They're doing 50 reps, 60 reps. They're doing, you know, burn. There's no load and, and, they're, tr and they're feeling the muscle burn. And yeah, they feel their glutes. But there's no muscle building going on because they're afraid of loading. I, I so think, you got to train heavy too. I think a lot of that too is just a, a marketing strategy. Um, it, because if you're if you're training someone who's a beginner client who doesn't necessarily know about programming, getting them to feel it is like a big deal, right? Yeah. So if I write a program for someone who doesn't know any better, um, and I write you know uh, glute kickbacks and fire hydrants and you know floor bridges, body weight floor bridges, like in these you know frog pumpers and like I got all these like kind of mm -hmm. you know uh, which have their place, isolated, you yeah, know, type exercises. right? They they have value. I'm not saying and and if I get someone to do, and then I have uh, let's say that's program one, okay, and then I write a program that is good mornings, deadlift, squat lift, squatting. Those are like the main exercises. The, the one problem that I know that, and this is, let's say this is a virtual program, 
the program that's got all these bullshit little exercises in there, the client's going to feel that. Mm -hmm. They're going to feel it in their butt because it's easy when you're doing these little little glute kickbacks and stuff because they're small isolation exercises yeah. that help target that. And they're going to feel, oh, I feel the burn yeah. in my butt. Then I, they're, they're not familiar with good mornings. They're not familiar with deadlifts. They're not familiar with squats. And they have all the posture issues that we were talking about. Although this program will build way more of an ass than this program, mm -hmm. the client who has no experience does this one and doesn't feel anything in their butt because it's not fire purpose. So then they did they just right away discount that as oh that's not a good program. This is a good program because I feel it in my ass all the time. But the truth is this is this the more superior program as far as what is going to build their butt, but because they don't feel it. So that's part of the hurdle for good coaches and trainers to get over is that you've got people that have tried these these little pumping type exercises and it's easy for them. They can have pretty bad form and still fill it in their glutes. So they think that that's a better, a better program for building their butt. When in reality, if we can get them to train their glutes properly and fire them properly, this program is far more superior in doing that. So yeah. I think that's part of the hurdle. Yeah. And you know, here's the, here's the thing too, with those other, those exercises that you mentioned, the little pumping ones or whatever, they have value. And a lot of the value of those is being able to add frequency to your training. They shouldn't be the core of your workouts, right. but they're great for adding frequency, which is the other big issue, which is people aren't training with the optimal amount of frequency to build their butt. You probably want to hit your butt uh, with good lifts, you know, two or three days a week. Mm -hmm. Then on the other days in between, especially if your butt is a focus for you, then you throw in the exercises that you just yeah. talked about. Your frog pumpers, your body weight hip thrusts, your you know fire hydrants and you know uh, kickbacks, those are great exercises to add volume and not too much damage. But what they do is they they maintain this really loud muscle building signal, yeah. and then you see especially this is especially for people who see development in other parts of their body, but the glutes seem to be lagging. Like this is one way to really get the glutes to catch up is to increase the frequency. But you can't just do heavy lifts every single day yeah, you can't you can't be back barbell squatting three times a week you yeah. could but the you, the likely of you hood of overtraining that, that way is more likely right? yeah right. no but that reinforces that it's a priority and the, and the body responds accordingly and so to be able to do that properly and have that kind of low to moderate intensity in between it just keeps that signal alive it keeps that a priority for your body to build and develop that area so you know that's something to definitely want to focus on if this is your goal is to build uh you know substantial glutes i mean i see two applications there right i see i see them as as great exercises for frequency builders like you're talking about and then also great for priming yes right so they're they're great if yeah, I, you'll find all those in like trigger sessions with our program maps and yeah, focus, focus sessions, sessions yeah. with maps aesthetic you're, you'll find those exercises, but they have to be used. Yeah, and they're, we put them in the butt builder guide for that exact reason. The idea is that, okay, I'm, I'm helping this person get that connection, that mind-muscle connection to the glutes by doing these very basic, easy exercises to fire the glutes so that when I go over and do the exercise that really build the glutes, they will fire properly. That's kind of the, the idea behind that. But what you see most common in the gym is you see people doing those exercises all the time and neglecting the big barbell movements that are really going to move the needle in, in your pursuit of building Dude, your you're glutes. You're so right. Uh, I would say this was more true uh, in the past than it is now, but still pretty true. And that is that people are just emphasizing the wrong exercises when they want to build a butt. Like, like barbell squat. And this was very true when I was uh, a trainer, you know, years ago. Uh, barbell squats are so, as one of the best butt building exercises you could do. And yet, when people would go to build their butt, you wouldn't see barbell squats. In, the re in fact, I mean, geez, when I first became a trainer, nobody did mm -hmm. barbell squats. Like deadlifts. Deadlifts are an incredible butt building exercise. You rarely would see anybody doing deadlifts or deadlift variations to build their butt. So it's the wrong emphasis on the wrong exercises. And, you know, just like it's true for building your chest or your shoulders or your back, the compound lifts with good load is what's going to give you the best results. I mean, I remember specifically one client. I had this, this woman that I trained who she wanted – like her goal was to get a nice, uh, you know, in her words, bikini looking type body, right? And she showed me her routine. She was advanced in the sense that she'd been working out for a long time. And I looked at her workout and I said, why? I saw no barbell squats and no deadlifts. 
And I'm like, well, why don't, why don't you barbell squat and deadlift? Well, I don't want to get big. I'm not trying to get huge. I'm like, well, you're not going to get big or huge, <laughs> but you want to build your butt. This is, these are some exercises you should probably do. So literally, this is, I mean, no joke. And luckily I can be very convincing because I had to sell her on this. I cut out 80% of her exercises wow. and we got really good at deadlifting and squatting and her butt grew like she, she'd never developed it before. She had this, and she's like, oh my God, my butt is so round. I can't believe these two exercises are so much better than those other mm. 15 ones that I was doing before. And it's like, yeah, you know, exercises are not all created equal. Some are way better for correctional purposes. Some are way better for balance and function and some just build muscle yeah. and they build muscle very, very well. And, you know, like a barbell squat, for example, like it is at the top of lower body, just in general, building exercises. And you see a bit of hesitancy here, uh, mainly because, I mean, it does require good technique. It requires you to understand, you know, how to hold your, your body throughout this, this movement. And so there's a bit of an education there, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it to go through that process, you know, hire a coach or, you know, really like study through some videos and, and master the form of it because, you know, your body's going to be able to generate a lot more force throughout this exercise, which in turn, uh, you know, your, your glutes are going to get a lot more of that uh, demand, uh, which it's not going to get from these little tiny exercises. Well, I think it goes back to the feeling thing. I think that's yeah. the main problem here. I think that clients feel these little isolation exercises and so then they it, that just makes you think I, think about it if you didn't have your knowledge that you have an experience that you have and you did something and you really felt one exercise in the area you want to develop and then another exercise you do you don't feel it as much well what would you think as a non-experienced non-trainer what would you say well, and i ask you i quiz you which one of these exercises does your butt more you would say the well, isolation the, here, the, the here's, kickbacks here's an example i used to give to people when we'd have this discussion sometimes people would debate me and i'd say okay because it's funny when you talk about other muscles so everybody understands. Yeah, right. Do you use the you quad. Get, use the quads. Yeah. With leg extensions, you feel leg extensions like crazy in your quads. Well, they're not going to do anything to your quads like a squat would. Yeah, like a Bulgarian split stance or like yeah. a traditional squat. Well, here's here's the example I used to give. I would tell people, okay, uh, what's one of the best exercises to develop good strong shoulders? They'd be like, oh, a standing overhead press or military press. I'd say, awesome. So, what are you going to feel more of a burn? Five sets of five reps with an overhead press. Or if I take your arms and extend them out to your sides and you do shoulder circles for three <laughs> minutes straight, you know? Yeah. The, the shoulder are going to burn the shit uh, out of your shoulders. Burn, yeah. yeah. But you're not going to develop, you know, any muscle really doing it that way. So, uh, but is there value in those movements in learning how to feel the muscle so that when you do the big lifts, you can do them right? Absolutely. You know, back to what Justin was saying about your technique and form. This is why we talk so much about practicing exercises versus just training yep. for fatigue. Your technique and skill really determines how much you get out of the exercise. So to use another example, so if we stick with, for example, a barbell squat, and we'll say, okay, the, the, the goal of the squat in, in this particular context is to develop the butt. So we do squats because we want to develop the butt. All right, let's use another example, right? Uh, my goal with throwing is to get the baseball to go as far as possible. A big part of what determines how far the baseball goes is definitely how much power I generate, but there's also my technique. Like a bodybuilder is way more powerful than a baseball player, but the baseball player will throw far further, right? Why is that? They've, they, they know how to express the movement much more and generate more force to get the ball to move faster through their technique. If you squat or do any other exercise with really good technique and skill, you're going to throw, essentially throw the ball further. You're going to get more out of that particular lift. So it's very important that you do the following exercises. And I say following because I think we should list some of the best butt building exercises that you should do. And you, these exercises should be in your routine in one way, shape, or another if your goal is to develop uh, your butt. So let's start with some of the ones that we know to be some of the most effective I think one of the more obvious ones, which you hear a lot of people talking about nowadays, uh, is the barbell hip thrust. Uh, this is uh, this could be labeled as a compound lift, although the knee joint doesn't have a lot of activation. It's the compound lift. You could go pretty heavy on it, and it does focus on the butt, and it does build uh, the butt. So hip thrust should be in your routine if you're trying to build. I you know, round I butt. think this one is king in this in this area because. It it almost uh, it is a compound lift that almost acts like an isolation exercise. Yeah, good point. 
It's uh, it's uh, maybe the, that's a, that's a very rare combination, isn't right? It? Yeah, a, co- a compound lift that actually moves like an isolation exercise. So it's I mean everything is pretty stable, and the weight is directly opposing gravity uh, with the glutes, and it's easy for even somebody who doesn't have a great connection to the glutes to fill it in their glutes. Mm-hmm. That's why I think this this has got to be in the routine, and it's probably well, it's basically the bench press for glutes. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, it it really is and I think it's it should be in every every program if you're doing that and it's one of the best ways one to load really well safely without somebody getting getting hurt who doesn't have really good technique yet in barbell squatting or deadlifting. That's a thank you. I'm so glad you said that because there's always this debate what's better to build the butt, barbell squats or hip thrusts. I think if you have a poor connection, hip thrusts are extremely valuable. Once you get a good connection, though, um, and you can get the, the glutes to fire and you've got good technique, barbell squats are hard to beat. They're hard to beat, especially a good full squat. And studies will show this, by the way. Hey, if you do a half squat, it's mostly quad. But if you're doing a good full squat, you've got good stability, mobility, you're going to activate your glutes a lot, especially at the bottom of the squat. And a barbell squat is very functional. Like the carryover from barbell squats into – any other lift or real life or performance or balance or stability or health is just tremendous. And remember, we talked about why we like looking at the glutes so much. Mm-hmm. There's the evolutionary aspect of it that it's functional, right? Yeah. Barbell squats are very functional. So when you can do barbell squats right and you do them and you're good at them, you're not going to have a part of your lower body that's really not well developed. And that includes the prime hip movers, which are the glutes. Well, and to that point of, of getting proper depth, like a lot of times you see with uh, as you age, like you lose certain ranges of motion. And this is where all the problems uh, yes. start to arise. And so to be able to keep ahead of that and stay strong with depth uh, with your hips down that position will help tremendously going forward in terms of the longevity of you know the health of your joints and the strength uh, to support your body from the lower half. I also think that, that squats are, are, are better because there's a little bit more emphasis on the eccentric portion of the exercise. There is. If you watch somebody do a hip thrust, it's it's mainly just the thrusting portion. You very rarely ever see someone hip thrust and really focus on the weight. It's a sh- it's a short range of motion. Yeah, it's a short range mm-hmm. of motion. It's primarily fo- focus on the concentric, concentric portion of the right. exercise. Most people thrust up at the top, squeeze, and then let it drop down. Mm-hmm. Thrust up, squeeze, let it drop down. And we know that the, one of the best portions of an exercise for building is the eccentric portion. And so I think squats do that. And then I also think that the stability component, even though it's bilateral, I still think that the stability component in squatting totally. is much greater than in a hip thrust. It's a longer range of motion mm-hmm. at the bottom of the squat. The hips have to stabilize. Yes. The glute meat is one of the main main muscles that's responsible for stabilizing the hips, which is, gives you that kind of you know uh, heart-shaped yeah, butt that everybody yeah. wants like that. That, I think you get more of that with the squat. And so even though they've, I know uh, Brett Contreras has done some really good studies and research to show that there's more glute activation in a hip thrust, but there's other components that you, it's not just about, you know, an e-stim activation. There's also more going on when you do a barbell squat versus a hip thrust. Yeah, also. I mean, uh, hip so thrusts got to be up there. Yeah, hip thrusts are up there, but barbell squats give you more than just uh, developing your glutes. So they have to be in, they have to be in your routine if you want well-developed glutes and a lower body that communicates well and good, uh, good stability all the way around. But yeah, you, you talk about range of motion. Compare the range of motion of a hip thrust to the range of motion of a full squat. Right. I mean, a full squat is one of the biggest, I'd say, I, I'm not, I'm thinking what exercise would have a larger range of motion than a squat? For the glutes? The, for the, any part of the body. I think no. it's one of the largest range of motion exercises, right? Involves the the knee joint, the hip joint. I mean, you're going all the way down, all the way up, especially with a full squat. That's a that's a very, very long range of motion type exercise. It's probably one of the reasons why it's so functional and why when you do them right, it's so important for for overall lower body and lower back, and health. that's why it can't mm-hmm. be discounted. Because I again, I know that there's been a lot of stuff, and Brett Contreras has definitely been like the leader in this, right? Because he's the one that really brought the the hip thrust to the forefront for people. And I 100 percent thinks it, I think it's king, and it's one of the best exercises you can do. Because I think again, for the simplicity of it, right? You could take somebody who's a, a pretty new lifter mm-hmm. and get them to start loading a barbell thrust a lot sooner than you can get a client who's new to probably load a barbell totally. back squat really well. But all things equal, if you have 
advanced lifters who can squat really well, obviously know how to hip thrust really well. I think that in that case, that's where I would say that the squat becomes superior to the hip thrust, but it's a very close call when you're, and they both belong in the routine. Yeah. The next exercise would be a deadlift. Uh, and it could be a conventional deadlift. It could be deadlifts in their variations. Like a, my favorite would be the Romanian deadlift where the knees are bent, but fixed. And so it's all hip. And what's interesting, by the way, of a Romanian deadlift, technically it's an isolation movement or a single joint exercise, you would say, right? Because the knees are supposed to stay locked, but it definitely performs like a compound lift. Like you can get really strong and develop tremendous hamstrings and glutes from doing that exercise. But even a conventional deadlift, like if you do a good conventional deadlift, the prime movers are the hips. Now, we typically refer to the deadlift as a back exercise, and I still think it's an excellent back exercise. But the prime movers, biomechanically speaking, are the hips. That's what's getting the weight to come up. And it's the butt. It's the glutes. This exercise, especially in the beginning of my career when hip thrusts were, were nowhere near popular, uh, it was deadlifts. Deadlifts was like my prime way of, de of getting people's butts to build. And it was super effective. You know, sumo style, you know, uh, conventional style. Just a great exercise. Also extremely functional. I mean, if you could deadlift well with good form and technique and stability and you get strong, you're getting close to developing a low back that is bulletproof in everyday life. I mean, you could deadlift your body weight or more with good form and stability. Like, you're going to feel like your low back is impervious. Uh, not, and I'm not, I want to be careful when I say that. Of course, there's always risk of injury. But, I mean, I fixed more backs with uh, good deadlifts than almost anything else. I, sumo deadlifts is like my, one of my favorite exercises to teach for this. Um, one, in the sumo stance, it puts you a little bit more in the squatted position. So you uh, naturally get a little more glute than hamstring activation, I think, than you would on a conventional deadlift. So I like that. Plus, because your feet are externally rotated, it turns that glute meat on, right? So well, you got to push out, right? Yeah. Remember that. And so that's, and, and, and I just think that the glute meat is one of those muscles that is just underdeveloped on most people. We just don't do a lot of hip stability work. Mm -hmm. And that muscle, if you train it, It'll definitely make the shape of your butt mm -hmm. way, way more round or pronounced. And the, I think that the sumo deadlift, especially if you're somebody who conventional deadlifts all the time, if you that's the main way you deadlift, if you ever deadlift is conventional and you don't do sumo a lot, what a great exercise to do for for building the butt for somebody. Yeah, and there's contention, you know, of course, with academics oh, yeah. about all this kind of stuff. But it's really like when we're talking about compound lifts, the value of them, we can load them some substantially and it's going to affect so many muscles in your posterior chain. So all the way up uh, and, and to be able to put more demand uh, on those muscles is, you know, how we're going to actually achieve the growth. And so to be able to incorporate lifts like this, even though it's not in isolation, you're not going to feel this specifically all the time, uh, just in the glutes, you're going to feel this all over your backside. Uh, you know, so much value there in combination with these other ones we're mentioning. By the way, too, this is what we didn't list this on any of our stuff, but this is, uh, and I'm, we should address this because I know somebody's going to be thinking about that. One of the most popular things you've seen in the gym in the last decade is the banded knees in all of these oh, right. exercises yeah, and what and that's that's to the point that i'm talking about about the external rotation in the feet right and of the the kind of pushing the so my feet are externally rotated and what obviously when you do a sumo deadlift what you're trying to keep from happening is the knees collapsing yes, you in. have to push out so intrinsically i have to push out the band just gives you that feedback. So the, and and it's it, we're developing the muscle that I was talking yeah. about that is so underdeveloped on so many people. So that's why so many you see so many people doing it because it it's worked for them and they don't necessarily realize what they what they're doing. But that's exactly what's yeah. happening. And I just I would intrinsically teach a client to do that versus having to you use. You can the do tool. it without the band. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, let's be honest. The band in position that you hold really isn't building much muscle. No. What's building the muscle is the fact that you now have feedback and you know how to intrinsically activate That's certain right. muscles. So, and this, we understood this as trainers. I would do, look, I'll give you an example. I had a client once who, um, I don't remember what sport it was that he, that he played, but he developed this really bad imbalance between his right and left side. And when we would squat, if we squat with any load, his left knee would start to travel in a little bit. And so what I did is I attached a band to his left knee and anchored it uh, on the squat rack. So we had to push out as we squatted. Oh, yeah, now, why band, did I do that? Band distraction. It was, yeah, it's just I'm getting him to 
feel something pushing in so he knows to push out. Now, can I do that without a band? Absolutely. I would just tell him, push out. But sometimes people need that outside you know, mm-hmm. feedback. And we would do this with trainers with our hands. Here, push against my hand or squeeze right here where I'm touching. And this will help people. Yeah, they're so, educational tools. Yeah. So when you're doing a sumo deadlift, you don't just get in the position and lift. In fact, if you talk, by the way, if you listen to power lifters on how to sumo deadlift properly, what do they always say? Spread the floor with yeah. your feet and your knees, right? What, what they're really saying is push out, activate those, those side butt muscles, which make you more stable and stronger. And that's when the sumo deadlift becomes an incredible butt building, you know, exercise. And by the way, the, the band, the band uh, around the knees is a great tool. But if you're somebody who does that all the time, the idea of that is to teach you to do that intrinsically yes. yourself. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, nothing. I got nothing wrong with someone using that as a tool. But it's become so popular that you see people doing it all the time, nonstop, in all their leg exercises because again, they feel it. Right? Mm-hmm. If they're pushing out on a band, they're squatting. All of a sudden, they feel the side butt light up like. Yeah. They never have before and they attribute that oh it must be the band that's doing that well no that's you forcing your knees out now that you grasp that and you understand that you can feel that connection. now you can do it without the band so now yes. get rid of the training wheels and actually get rid of the band and try and do that intrinsically by, while you by the way it, we said deadlifts you could throw in there um good mornings it, yeah too. good mornings or any kind of hip hinge exercise a good morning is essentially the same movement as like a romanian deadlift the difference is the weight is uh, on your upper back rather than in front of you with your hands. If you have really good core stability and technique, good mornings, you could load and you could go hard and strong and really develop the glutes. This was an exercise back in the day that bodybuilders used to compete over was actually good mornings. Who could lift the most? Now, you got you better have excellent technique when you do oh, this, yeah. just like with any exercise, but I would put that up there. I would put that up there with the dead. No, it's got to go here because here's, like I actually have a client right now that I help and um, she's 56 years old and one of the things that she she has, she has a job where she's uh, on the computer all the time, so we're constantly dealing with wrist stuff. Mm-hmm. So her wrist and grip are always giving out, so she could load the bar bell way more on a good morning than she can on a deadlift where she has to grip the bar and hold up. So there's definitely places where you're going to have, and that's actually, I've had a lot of clients yep. where the grip was the limiting factor for them to load the bar. And so you could either one, use wrist wraps in that situation, or I can do a different exercise like a good morning where I could load it and she doesn't have to hold onto the bar, yes. her, her back and core supporting yeah. it. Uh, next, I would put uh, split stance type lifts like lunges and Bulgarian mm-hmm. split stance stand squats. Here's one of the reasons why I loved lunges so much. Getting a person to do a full squat can be really challenging sometimes. Getting them to do a lunge where they go down to where if you look at the front leg on a lunge, it's essentially doing a squat. Mm -hmm. You get them to do a full range of motion lunge. It's as if that front leg is doing a a relatively full range of motion squat, at least parallel or maybe even a little below parallel, especially if you elevate that front leg a little bit. So it's easier to get that full range of motion, at least in that hip area. And so I think it just activates it, you know, really well. Yeah. And I think too, to somewhat of your point of like the eccentric, I think, um, you know, the added component here is stability. Yes. And so uh, to be able to split your stance in general, I think, uh, you know, people kind of go through the motions throughout the day and and sort of find their way back to balanced, you know, uh, set where their feet are kind of like in the same position. But uh, to be able to spend more time in that split stance requires a lot of balance. Mm -hmm. And so now, uh, to add on top of that, you know, that component where we're squatting our way down and still being able to stabilize left to right, um, you know, requires a little bit more intensity, uh, which then stimulates the muscle in a completely different way, which has massive value, uh, you know, for the glutes. Well, Sal just glazed over something that I think we have to go back over because I this was something I used a lot for this client in particular, and that is a lunge that is elevated. Yeah. Uh, one of the number one limiting factors for clients that are trying to get deep squats is their ankle mobility. Totally. So many times uh, I am constantly working on that just to get them to even break parallel. We talked about the benefits of deep squats for the glute for all, as far as full range of motion. If I have a client who has a hard time getting deep squat, deep squats with good form, this is a great way to supplement this is to do a lunge that's elevated because it's like a single leg. Yeah, so I would put like a, I mean, literally you could put yeah. like a 45 pound plate on the ground. Yeah, or, yeah. or stack something. a couple of them. I'd yeah. stack two or three of them mm-hmm. and they lunge onto that plate. And when and you'll see if you stop at the very bottom, it's like a, a very- below parallel yeah, squat. Yeah, it's a mm-hmm. below parallel squat. And then they, don't, they can actually, 
actually step back so they, their knee doesn't have to travel as far over their toes, which is the ankle mobility piece that's limiting. So yes. it's a great way to get that deep squat position if you have a client that has poor ankle mobility. Yeah, so like walking lunges, back step lunges, Bulgarian split stance squats, all these variations are excellent for developing the butt. That that split stance movement, you know, and by the way, this is extremely functional. Our legs operate very, or at least they should operate in a way to where one leg is behind stabilizing. The other leg is kind of pushing forward. This is what happens when you walk and you run is you have kind of this contralateral thing going on. And if you never do split stance exercises, you're missing out. You know, I'll, I'll never forget seeing one of my good friends who's a, a very, very competitive power lifter who did, who squatted all the time and could squat record weight do back step lunges and never really had him in his, his routine. And I remember watching him do the back step lunges and I'm like, okay, here's a guy who squats 700 pounds and he's having trouble with 135 pounds because he never trains yeah. that split stance, you know, uh, you know, kind of movement or technique. So it's really important that you incorporate this as well. Now, the last one um, is important because as, as we said at the beginning of the episode, the glutes are very, very uh, active in balance. They really are. Stand on one leg and balance. And what you'll find besides your ankle getting tired is you'll no start to notice your butt starts to kind of fatigue and what the hell is going on. It's uh, Your hip is a, a, a joint that moves in all kinds of different directions. It rotates and it goes out to the side, the front, the back. And so it's your butt that holds everything steady and, and together along with the hip flexors, but mainly it's the glute that keeps you stable. So single leg toe touches, single leg deadlifts, like those single leg exercises – your butt will fire like crazy. I mean, uh, I you know, it's actually, I can't even think of a single person I've ever trained who didn't tell me when I did a single leg toe touch. Even people who said their butts don't fire, let's do this movement and balance with no weight. And I, I can't think of a single person that didn't say, oh my God, I can feel that in my butt. No, it's one of my favorite exercises also to teach. And it's also kind of the, the, the beginning, right? So this is, uh, if you get somebody to single leg, you know, deadlift, really, really well, even just with their body weight, right? Being able to balance and stabilize right? without having to put their foot on the ground every yeah. every single rep. If they can actually do five to eight reps without having to touch with the other foot and they've got that stability, down really well, they're really ready for a lot of these other movements because mm -hmm. that's a challenging movement to do, just even body weight, much less load it. And if you can get to the point where you're loading that because of the stability component, you'll see your develops like grow fast. Yeah, I, I think the the I love single leg toe touch exercises on trigger sessions, and I I also like them on focus sessions. Uh, but trigger sessions are my favorite because it's not a loaded exercise, right? It's just mm -hmm. body weight. Yeah. Uh, it's not super intense, so it's not going to like hammer my body. But let's say, for example, Maps Anabolic will have you working out with heavy foundational workouts two to three days a week. So it depends on your level of of fitness. You could pick two to three days a week. Then on the days in between, you do these trigger sessions. They're lighter, shorter workouts. Uh, you typically do two or three of them in a day. They last about eight minutes. You do toe touches on those trigger sessions. Yeah. Watch what happens to your butt. Like it just, it grows and it develops, especially when you combine it with those heavy workouts. Yeah, I always thought it was just a good idea uh, in between, especially like really trying to build and develop with these bilateral like barbell loaded type exercises to uh, be able also to check and see like where the compensations are and the discrepancies are left to right. And so like this is one of those exercises that will really highlight uh, you know, any kind of instability in the hip, uh, anything there that uh, we can we can strengthen, you know, uh, both sides equally if we put more emphasis, uh, you, you know, on both independently. Yeah, well, when we, when we built uh, the butt builder program, like literally this is was the logic behind that, right? We, a lot of the pro, a lot of the program for anabolic and aesthetic, that part of it, the foundational stuff is what everyone's familiar with. But the butt builder part of it is all these focus and trigger sessions addressing all the exercises that we're talking about. And that was the, the science behind what we're doing. Yeah, totally. Okay, so, so here's the deal, right? So we just gave you basically the answers to what you can do uh, to most effectively get your glutes to grow, develop, become stronger, improve your performance. But a lot of times people want it written out. They want the programming, they want the reps, the sets, they want the exercise demos to learn how to do them properly. We talked about technique. So what we did a while ago is we put together a build your butt bundle, which includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Aesthetic, two of our most popular muscle building programs, 
along with the kettlebell for aesthetics program, which is always included uh, in that bundle. So there's some, some alternative kettlebell type exercises. And then in there, what we did is we put specific trigger sessions and specific focus sessions for people who want to build their butt. It's called the build your butt bundle. And because we're doing this episode, what we've done is we've taken that bundle, which is already discounted. So normally what we do is we have that bundle and I think it discounts both programs, something like 30% off or something like that. What we did because of this episode is we took an additional 50% off. So it's something like 70 or 80% off the normal price of all those programs. Uh, so this is, if you're interested in doing this, what you do is you go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. You find the Build Your Butt Bundle, and then you use the code BUTT50, so B-U-T-T-5-0. So B-U-T-T-5-0 with no space, and this particular promotion will expire uh, Halloween. So October 31st is the last day for this uh, particular promotion. Also, if you want to get more free information from us, head over to mindpumpfree.com. We have lots of free guides there that can help you with lots of your fitness goals. And then if you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Instagram. So Justin's at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.